so good morning everyone uh, thank you for this uh, opportunity to give you a introduction to something i really like uh, to talk about and to work with um, i'm sure this week you have all worked with um, uh, and learned a lot about remote sensing in general uh, with a particular focus on uh, optical remote sensing uh, for obvious reasons uh, uh, but in this presentation in the next couple of hours uh, we will go through a slightly different uh, way of uh, remote sensing namely using an active instrument uh, using a radar instrument which we uh, could have in orbit on a satellite, or you could have it on a ground or even on an aircraft. Uh, so um, uh, this is the first lecture I give over Zoom. So I, I, I don't really know how to do it with questions, but please, please ask questions in the chat window, for example, and then we could uh, we could save some time in the end to to try to go go through them. Um, this uh, um, this work is a con is is of course a contribution from many people at Norse and other colleagues, um, mainly from Lynn Rouillet, who is actually doing her uh, PhD project now on working on permafrost areas in Svalbard using uh, satellite radar interferometry. Uh, I work for the Norse, which is a Norwegian research center in. Um, and I am based in Tromsø in Norway. So in this talk, we will go through satellite radar interferometry. Uh, I will introduce without going into much, too much details, but hopefully enough to give you a concept of, of what it's about. Uh, radar remote sensing, the advantages of, of using an active instrument and uh, also the INSAR interferometry uh, part of it. Um, I will use uh, quite a lot of examples uh, to illustrate uh, the possibilities, some of the limitations uh, of using the method. And uh, many, uh, many, but not all of the examples are from Arctic. So we will show how you can use this, uh, this remote sensing technology to, to monitor uh, surface deformation or ground motion in the Arctic. Uh, and I will also show quite a lot of examples from Norway, which is where uh, this, uh, this work started from, from our end. Uh, so in order to monitor the ground stability, ground motion, there are many ways uh, to do it. You could install um, ground-based or terrestrial uh, in situ instrumentation such as for example GPS. Uh, you could go in the field, you could do mapping, uh, you could measure the extension of these uh, fractures or cracks that you observe. Uh, you can do, you can use um, uh, underground instrumentation. Uh, so for example you could have a uh, uh, borehole with instrumentation and you could have temperature loggers in the borehole and then you could have more traditional remote sensing methods such as ground-based instruments uh, to the left you have a we have a terrestrial laser scanner which is a, a way of remote sensing uh, you could have a ground-based radar system i will show you some examples uh, we could have satellite sar SAR is a synthetic aperture radar. It's an active instrument. You could have satellite optical instruments, microwave instruments, like you probably have discussed a lot this week. You could have uh, an UAS or drone-based uh, instrumentation. So all in all, there's, there's a lot of ways to, to, to measure uh, parameters on the ground. But in this talk, uh, in this lecture, we will focus on these two. Uh, we will talk about the satellite and the ground-based radar systems and, and how that could be used uh, in particular for monitoring ground motion. So how does a radar work? Well, a radar is an active instrument. It is uh, transmitting an electromagnetic pulse and then it's measuring the time for the echo to return. So in this example we see 
to the left, uh, a way to measure the distance to this aircraft. And if you have two aircraft, you could also uh, see where they are and, and see their velocity. Uh, of course, this is used everywhere uh, for many, many purposes. And, and probably even your, your uh, if you have a modern car, it also has a radar in, in some, some way. Uh, and the radar uh, means radio detection and ranging. So basically you are transmitting an electromagnetic pulse and then measuring the time for, for the echo to come back. So you are creating your own energy. So this is uh, the main principle here is that we are transmitting a pulse and we are receiving an echo, which is dependent on a few things. It's dependent on the target properties, meaning how well uh, does the target reflect uh, the incoming radar wave, but it's also dependent on the distance to the target. So mainly we, we are measuring two parameters in, in these radar systems. We are measuring the radar intensity, which is related to how strong is your reflection. How much, how much energy do you uh, receive uh, on your satellite? But we are also measuring something we call the phase. And the phase is directly uh, related to distance to the target. And what we, try, what we see in the cartoon uh, to the right is a typical elect electromagnetic wave that is being transmitted. Uh, it has a certain amplitude uh, and it has a certain wavelength. And the wavelength is, is, is for these radars that we are uh, using typically on the order of a few centimeters. And the phase is uh, very important and it describes uh, uh, this wave, uh, the position of the wave front. So that can be used to, to monitor and to measure the distance uh, very accurately, actually down to a, a fraction of the wavelength. So when the wavelength is five centimeters and we can measure it at a fraction of, of that, we have a very sensitive uh, instrument to measure the distance. And what happens if you put one of these instruments in space? Well, of course, you will have a fantastic coverage um, and again, since, it, since it, it is an active instrument, it, there is no need for external illumination. Uh, it does penetrate clouds. It does, to a certain degree, penetrate vegetation, depending on the wavelength of the radar signal. Um, and we can measure like I've told you, uh, the phase, the distance at a fraction of the wavelength. And of course, since it is on a satellite, it has a more or less continuous uh, spatial and temporal coverage. So this is uh, how uh, the geometry works. The satellite is flying along its uh, trajectory here, and it is looking towards the left in this example. And while it is flying, it is imaging this yellow uh, area on the ground, which we call SWOT width. And this SWOT width is very dependent on the, resolu the, the ground resolution of the satellite. So if you have a very, very high resolution sensor, you typically have a very small SWOT width. So there is always a trade-off between resolution and SWOT and or resolution and the area that you are uh, observing. Uh, but for satellite SAR instruments, uh, this is typically on the order from a few kilometers up to maybe 500 kilometers. Uh, I will uh, go a little more into details later. But uh, this is the main uh, geometry of uh, the satellite radar observations. Uh, you could also note that the radar is not looking directly 
down, so it's not looking in a nadir direct direction, but it is looking uh, with uh, uh, what we call an incident angle. So it, it's it's not looking straight down, but it has an, uh, an incidence angle here, which is typically 35 degrees, between 25 and 45 degrees. Uh, so it's, it's a sideways uh, looking radar. And how does the SAR image look? Uh, well, to the left is a very high resolution satellite synthetic aperture radar image. To the right is an optical image. Um, this is uh, from the Oslo Central Station area. You can see the rail railroad and the tracks, and you can also see some some very high and, and tall uh, buildings. At least in the optical image, you have th three quite large and tall buildings here, and. Basically, what we see here is a, uh, to the left, so the radar image is a grayscale image. So when you have a very bright pixel, it means that the energy is very strong. So the energy that the radar is, the echo is very strong. And when you have a dark pixel, it means that less of the energy is reflected back to the satellite. So since this is an urban area with lots of buildings, uh, we typically have a lot of very strong targets. We have a lot of reflectors on the ground that gives us a lot of um, strong pixels. And, and clear, clearly you can see that uh, on the image to the left, you can see these tall buildings and you can almost count uh, the number of windows. Uh, you see these, these houses here with lots of very, very strong reflections. Uh, this is commercial satellite data. So this is typically not the resolution that we usually work with, but I wanted to show you uh, how it could look and, and to discuss the difference between uh, uh, the optical image and uh, the radar image. Uh, so, if you have areas with vegetation, which you don't have a lot of in this example, you will usually have uh, low, uh, low energy return to the satellite. If you have water areas, you, you will typically also have uh, not much energy being reflected because the water is acting uh, like a mirror, in particular, if there is no wind on the water. So what is uh, INSAR? Uh, INSAR stands for uh, SAR interferometry. And interferometry comes from the word interference. And it is basically to look at the phase difference between two SAR images. And to the cartoon to the, uh, in the cartoon to the left, you see uh, typical geometry. You have uh, two satellite observations named uh, T0 and T1, and they are looking at the same point on the ground, and they are measuring the, the, the distance to the target. Um, the main idea is that if you have uh, a shift in the ground, so meaning that the distance from the satellite to the ground is changing, uh, we have a very sensitive instrument to look at this subtle change in distance by looking at the phase difference between these two radar observations. Uh, this is very simplified, but it is th the main idea is to, to, to show you how the principle works. Um, what we also see here is that the two satellites, so, or the same satellite which is coming back uh, one repeat cycle later, for example, it is not repeating its orbit in exactly the same spot, meaning that we do also have a, a geometric configuration here, which provides some sensitivity to the topography, to the height of the point on the ground. 
So we could also estimate this. And if you, any of you have worked with the global or a near global uh, digital elevation model called SRTM, Shuttle Radar Topography Mission, uh, that was created quite some time ago, but they used this method. They used the INSTAR technology from the space shuttle in order to produce a global or clo near global diff um, uh, topographic model. Uh, we see also here that in one of the satellite images, uh, there is a cloud, there is a, an atmosphere here, and in the other one, there is not. And this is to illustrate that the atmosphere could also introduce some artifacts that we um, uh, are working and trying to reduce in, 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 as part of the processing. So how, how can you use this? Well, of course, if you have a very dramatic event on the ground, if you have an earthquake, for example, and if you have one image captured before the earthquake and one radar image taken after the earthquake, and if you look at the phase difference between these two images, we can produce an image which looks something like this. And of course, the first time this was produced at this scale, uh, it, was, it, had, it had so much impact that they got the front page of nature. So this is kind of indicating the significance of, of this method because this provided a way, a unique way to look at the ground deformation due to the earthquake that was unprecedented. I mean, you could have thousands of GPS stations and you would still not have the same spatial resolution. Uh, what you see in this uh, image is a number of what we call fringes. Uh, so a fringe is, is, is when you have a color, a gradient going from the same color to the next color. And each of these fringes corresponds to a line of sight change in distance of, of half the wavelength. And this is typically three centimeters. So you have to count the number of, of, of such phase transitions. And let's say you have 10 of them here that corresponds to 30 centimeters of ground motion um, due to the earthquake. So this is, uh, this is a, a quite unique uh, way to, to look at the ground deformation at a big scale. Uh, if we move to a slightly newer earthquake, this was in, in California uh, a few years ago, and this, was, this happened just a few weeks after the, one of the satellites was being commissioned for operational use, so it was very timely. And this is uh, in California, just north of San Francisco Bay Area. It is in the wine district of Napa and Sonoma, They're very well known for their wine production. And it was a fairly big earthquake, uh, which was th the biggest in California in, in more than 20 years. And again, if you look at one SAR image before, one after, and if you produce this difference, you will have a map again looking like this, which shows um, the, the main uh, ground motion that happened due to the earthquake. And the reason why here is very noisy is probably because uh, either the ground deformation was too severe, so it was really too damaged, or there is a lot of vegetation and agriculture in this area. So that is one, one limitation of, of this method. And of course, when this happened, it, it got quite a, a lot of attention because you could you could show this uh, on a wide scale and it, it got quite a lot of media attention. The BBC uh, made an, a web story about it, uh, how this Sentinel Copernicus um, radar system could picture this, this Napa earthquake. So it was a great PR for this European uh, satellite system. And it even made uh, uh, made it all the way to BBC World News. So this is uh, this is actually the journalist who wrote the web article who's trying to explain uh, how this method works and what you can see on the ground. 
But in Norway, in Svalbard, in most of Europe, uh, we don't have these uh, dramatic events. We don't have earthquakes. So instead, uh, what we are looking for using this method, we are looking for very subtle, very small deformation. If you have a landslide or if you have a, a, a rock slide, you could be you could be looking for surface deformation on the order of a few millimeters per year. And when you are looking for these small signals, uh, basically you have to use um, more advanced techniques. And these techniques, they exploit um, the fact that we could have a lot of these SAR images. We have to use the whole stack of images. And remember that this satellite is acquiring uh, an image every time it passes. So with Sentinel-1 and six days repeat cycle, you could have a lot of images in, in one year. And what you do is you search each, each image and you want to find those points that are very, very, have a very strong reflection, strong and stable reflection to the satellite. So, so we kind of define these as super targets or, or persistent points that we could that we could use for the analysis. Uh, so the cartoon uh, to the right shows a number of points. Of course, the density in real life is, is a lot higher, but this is just for illustration purposes that we look for those points that, that are stable. And by stable, I mean they, they have a uh, a good reflection throughout the time series. They could still be moving, absolutely. And by doing this, we could separate uh, some of these artifacts because usually what we are in interested in is ground motion. But if we can use these time series methods, we could separate the ground motion from atmosphere, which is a noise source. We could remove this contribution from the topography, because usually we have already a quite good uh, digital elevation model, so we could remove that contribution. And then we are able to estimate this ground motion with a very high accuracy. So we could, if we have a reasonably long time series, uh, you could estimate the ground motion uh, with uh, accuracy down to a few millimeters per year. So it's, it's a very precise method. And I should say that INSAR is a very active uh, research field. There's a lot of applications. Uh, some of them are more operational than others. Uh, of course, it is being used every time there is a major earthquake somewhere on the earth. There is always uh, some group looking at these images, trying to analyze them and trying to understand more about these processes. Uh, we could also use it to look at urban subsidence, which is of course a very, um, uh, very interesting and very useful application, which also has a commercial aspect. Uh, this image here is from the Oslo area. You can see the railroad station again, with a lot of, quite a lot of subsidence on the order of a few centimeters per year. Uh, we could use it for rock slide monitoring, and I think Norway is one of the countries in the world that has come the furthest when it comes to using INSAR in an operational matter. So we are now monitoring the whole of Norway, and we are also using uh, uh, INSAR in the active mapping of landslides and rock slides, which you could see in the lower left figure. Uh, so this is uh, all deformation of an active rock slide in Norway. The method could be used to monitor stability of hydropower dams or other kinds of land fillings. Uh, we could also use it to, to monitor glacier movement. And this image is actually not from a satellite radar, but it is from a ground-based radar monitoring the velocity of a moving glacier in Svalbard. And of course, there is one more application that I will come to in the, I think in the, in the second part of this, of this lecture. And that, it, that is how well is this 
method uh, for looking at the ground deformation in permafrost and periglacial areas uh, where you have a lot of processes going on on the ground. So I will show you more examples like that later. Um, basically the workhorse uh, that has made all of this possible on a global scale is Sentinel-1, uh, which is one of the European Union uh, operational Earth observation satellites. There is currently two satellites, Sentinel-1A and B, uh, and they are working together, providing uh, a coverage of this, uh, not a coverage, but a repeat cycle of, of six days of at least Europe and less uh, elsewhere on the world. But the main idea here uh, is that the data is free and open. So it, there is no, it's, it's very easy access to the data, to the raw data so that the data is, is being used a lot. Uh, the other fantastic thing is that it has a very long lifetime. It, it's not a scientific research satellite but it's, it's an operational platform and uh, the European Space Agency and EU, they are committed to providing this data in a consistent way for uh, several decades. So already now Sentinel-1, C and D are, are being planned. So, so this is really the, the workhorse for, for all work, at least in, in Europe for the time being. Uh, of course, INSAR doesn't work everywhere. Uh, this is uh, just trying to summarize uh, where it really does not work. Um, the first point is vegetation. If you have an area with a lot of vegetation, trees, uh, we just, the, the signal that is reflected is not consistent over time. Uh, because in order for insight to work, you need to have a stable and consistent signal being reflected back. So for example, in vegetation, you could have trees and leaves growing, you could have wind, you can have uh, uh, moisture and so on, changing the reflectivity a lot so that we don't have any signal. So usually uh, insight doesn't really work when you have uh, forest, trees, vegetation, agricultural areas, and so on. However, this is also dependent on the wavelength that you use. Uh, most of my examples here are from Sentinel-1, which is uh, C-band and five centimeter wavelength. But there are other sensors that have longer wavelength and with longer wavelength, you could penetrate through and into uh, the canopy and, and get some, some information also in vegetation vegetated areas. Uh, steep terrain and, and really fast motion is another problem. Uh, the steep terrain is mainly because you have uh, radar artifacts such as shadow and layover. I will shortly describe them uh, more. And it doesn't work when you have snow cover because if you have wet snow you will have total attenuation of the signal. But even if you have dry snow, you would have uh, a phase delay because of the water content of the snow. So because of Snell's law, you will have some additional delay through the snowpack. And that delay is very hard to separate from any ground motion. So usually we, what we do is that we use the data only from from the snow-free period of the year. Uh, so why does it work so well? Well, of course, the perfect area is a flat desert, uh, but we have had really good success in Norway, in particular in northern Norway, for landslide mapping, because the tree limit is, is at four or five hundred meters, and when you are above that, uh, we don't, uh, there, there is very limited vegetation and we have a very good reflection from this, this, uh, these areas. And of course, also Svalbard is a great example. So as long as you stay away from, from the glacier areas, 
you have very very little vegetation so the the, the radio signal is is quite consistent um, this image again is a radar image this is from a uh, an area in norway uh, with very high and very steep mountains and the, what we see here is shadow because the geometry the radar is looking from the left when you have a tall and high mountain you will have a shadow area behind the mountain where the radar has no information because there is a shadow and on the other side of the mountain on the front on the sides of the mountain that is facing the radar, you will have another artifact because the radar, the top of the mountain is closer to the radar than the foot of the mountain. <clears throat> so you will have a lot of signal coming back, back at the same time. So these two effects, you will observe them in the radar image as the very dark areas here, which are, uh, which is shadow and these white, very strong reflection signals uh, along the valley here, which is due to this layer effect. So usually in the radar processing, we mask out, we remove these areas where we, don't, where we have no information. And of course, in uh, mountainous areas, this could be, a, um, uh, th this could clearly limit uh, the, the, the areas that you could, could look at. Of course, this is dependent on the incidence angle, on how steep is the radar looking. So moving uh, to Norway first, I will show you some examples and some motivation for the work that we have done. Uh, in Norway, we have a number of landslides. And of course, these, some of these landslides have collapsed historically and a number of lives have been lost due to these rock avalanches uh, not because of the, the the rock fall itself but mainly because of this tsunami effect that uh, will propagate uh, through the lakes and, and fjords and a few years ago there was a movie a catastrophe movie from Norway called the wave uh, which was actually looking at uh, one of these landslides and and where one of these landslides was collapsing. And that is actually the landslide that you see to the left here. And what you see here is, is an INSAR result. Uh, typically we show these maps like this, where you have a color colors where you have information. So in this case, the red areas are movement of the landslide and the green areas are stable. And when, where there's no points or where there's gray color, there is no information. And, and the main reason here is because there is uh, vegetation in this area. Uh, so of course you have this uh, dramatic example. This is before the, the uh, rock slide tsunami, and this is after the tsunami. And what, what, what uh, is common for many of these uh, events is that there was many years of precursor movement. So, the main idea is, of course, you want to detect, you want to find all those mountains that are unstable in Norway. So this was the motivation behind a quite large project in Norway called INSA Norway, being run by the Geological Survey of Norway, Norwegian Space Agency, NVE, where uh, Norse, uh, did all the work, the development and algorithm work in order to, to produce a nationwide ground motion map over Norway. Uh, so we had a release in November 2018. There is more than, there is now more than 6 billion points in Norway. And we are now routinely processing all Sentinel-1 data that is covering our regions. Uh, we are in the end of the development phase and right now, uh, we have an update, uh, a, year, a yearly update. But for some of regions, for example, for the cities in the south, we, we, we would probably change this, this into more frequent updates. Um, what you can see <clears throat> from this map is the, which is, of course, on a very coarse resolution now, uh, is, is 
the point density. So you see in the southeastern part of Norway, where there is more uh, vegetation, there is not much points. Of course, if you zoom into Oslo area, you will, you will have a very high density of points. But if you move up in the mountains in the west, or even to the northernmost part of Norway, where you have lots of per-glacier, permafrost, um, freezing and thawing effects, you will see that there is not much vegetation and you really have a super um, uh, spatial coverage, uh, which could and should be exploited for further analysis. Uh, showing some examples, of course, uh, you could use this to look at um, uh, land fillings. This is the airport in the Trondheim, where they have made the runway longer. And of course, that is still subsiding due to the compaction of all the material that they put in the, in the, in the fjord, in the water. Uh, we have developed a portal. Uh, I, I suggest that you take a note of this web address and try to explore that uh, a little later. Um, where, where all the data is, is actually being uh, ha has been made available to everyone. There is no password, there is no login. You can just go in and browse. And, and during this, this afternoon, we will, I will, we will look more into this uh, portal and, uh, and to discuss how it can be used. But basically, it's a web portal. You can go in, you can navigate uh, all over Norway. You can click on points. And when you click on a point, you could uh, extract a time series, uh, which looks something like this for a landslide, for example. And the reason why there is such a long gap here is because we are not using the winter data. We are only using data from the snow-free period. Um, you could also look at it on a mobile device. Uh, however, it, it tends to drain your battery. And uh, also, you need a, a quite a good bandwidth on your, on your network to, to browse. But it, it works quite nice, and it's, it's, it's a quite nice experience. Some, a few more examples from Norway. This is Lofoten. Of course, when we, for the first time, had a nationwide map of ground deformation, everyone was very excited. And all the geologists were super busy for many, many weeks or months, just going through all of Norway, trying to find new and stable areas. And of course, they found some areas that they did not know about before. And I'll just show you a few of these examples here. Uh, this is one in Lofoten. Uh, this is one in the northern part of Norway, in the way north, close to the North Cape. Uh, north Cape is on this island here. This is the northernmost point in, in Europe. And there's a city, a small town, about four or 5,000 people here. And what we observed when we got this INSAR data was that there is a big red area here, which is more or less directly across this fjord, not, not too far away from, from this town. And when you zoom in, you will see that it's, it's a very well-defined block that has subsided and that is obviously still subsiding. And this has gained a lot of attention and there is the geologist had now been there. They are instrumenting it and trying to find out more about uh, uh, the processes that go, goes on. Uh, what you can see, the size of this is quite significant. So it's really a lot of, of rock that is moving and ha has, of course, a, a, a potential for, for great to produce a, a tsunami if, if everything would collapse at the same time. <clears throat> so again, seen from this, this town, you see this red point here is, 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 is quite close, so it could, it, it could clearly have an impact. Uh, this data could also be used to, to monitor uh, ground stability of infrastructure, such as bridges or Hydropower. This is a hydropower dam in Norway, and you could look at the stability and how this dam is moving. Um, uh, relevant to, or you could you could compare it to the, the water levels in in this uh, in this reservoir. 
So of course that this is very relevant in order to, to look at the st dam stability. Um, here is another example where one hydropower dam was uh, rehabilitated. So they were adding more rock. To, it's a rock filled dam, so they were adding more rock to it. Uh, and what you see here is the um, subsidence or the compaction of all this material uh, on the ground, which is, of course, as ex expected, but still. It is, it is very useful for the engineering geologist to know that everything is, is behaving as it should. And also for land fillings, this is uh, used now operationally. Uh, if you are building, a, if you want to build a bridge or a road over a land filling, usually you would like to wait until the land filling is stable or at least until the main compaction has happened. And the INSAR is now being used operationally to, to actually assist in that uh, in a cost uh, effective way. Um, in Norway, we are also using uh, corner reflectors. That is uh, typically what you see here, a metallic device, which is providing a very strong reflection to the satellite. And the reason why we use this is because we do want to have uh, information about the movement also in the winter, also when there is typically a snow cover. So we are making these reflectors on a, on a mast, on a tower that lifts them above, above the snow cover so that we could have information. So typically what we do, this is for an active uh, rock rock slide, we install a network of these uh, reflectors. So what you see here is, is uh, one of these high risk uh, rock slides in Norway, where we have a network of three reflectors. So one in the stable area and then, uh, and then two in the one stable and then two within the main rock slide. And what we can do then is to look at the deformation over time. So this is clearly subsiding here. We have uh, five years of data and it's moved more than 25 centimeters. So this is the two different um, uh, reflectors. And this is using Radarset 2 data, which had a 24 day repeat cycle, meaning that you would have one observation every 24 day. Uh, however, when we are adding the Sentinel-1 data, which has a six-day repeat cycle, you could see that the, the temporal resolution is really improving a lot. And this is using one track, but since we are so far north, and since these satellites are polar orbiting satellites, we do have quite a lot of overlap between the different tracks. And this is good because it provides us with even more coverage. So basically in the northern part of Norway and of course also in Svalbard, uh, you could have uh, a near daily coverage. Uh, so this is now uh, being used uh, operationally by uh, the Norwegian Water and Energy Directorate who is responsible for all landslides. So they are using these corner reflector data alongside other instruments. So it, it's now being automatically processed. And uh, this is, has, has proven to be a very cost-effective way to, to monitor the stability of uh, a landslide, because you don't need any, in, you don't need a lot of infrastructure. You don't need power, you don't need electricity. It is all, a passive device that you are installing. Um, one fact uh, that we should discuss shortly is what we call the line of sight. Uh, this is a screenshot from the INSA Norway portal. Uh, to the left, you see that you have some base layers and you have one field which is called deformation. And when you go into that deformation, you will see that there is one data or uh, one or more data sets from ascending geometry and one or more uh, data sets from descending geometry. And this is, it, this tells you which direction the satellite was, was flying. So 
if you have a descend, uh, ascending, it is moving towards the north. And the satellite SAR is always looking to, towards the right. So this is looking towards the east. And then the descending geometry is again looking towards the west. And you should also always think about this incidence angle. What is the direction that the, the satellite is looking? Because it is a radar, it's an active instrument, it's, it's always only measuring the deformation in the line of sight. So if there is a deformation which is perpendicular, for example, we have no sensitivity. And uh, what you can see from this, this uh, drawing to the left is that if you have a horizontal movement in the north-south direction, that's actually quite perpendicular to these line of sight vectors. So the horizontal component is actually um, the, the component that, that, that we can see the least uh, in the north-south direction. Um, but if we look at a landslide or a fjord in Norway, here we have um, uh, one geometry from ascending mode, meaning that uh, the satellite is looking towards the east. So here we clearly see that there is a big landslide here, obviously moving towards the fjord. Um, so this is a fjord and this is a, a big landslide here. Uh, but on the other side of the fjord, you see some blue color here, which indicates that this area is actually, this area is actually coming towards the satellite, which is a little bit strange. If you look at this descending geometry, so now the satellite is looking towards the west, you see that this large area is also an active landslide. It is moving towards the fjord. So to sum up this is that you basically have to use both geometries uh, because they are sensitive to different kind of, of deformation direction. Uh, so here in the descending mode, we can see no deformation on this uh, in this area and the opposite. So you have to use both geometries when you are looking at an area in particular with, with topography uh, because you you were only sensitive to this movement in in this line of sight direction. Uh, what we can do, and there is some uh, research going on, is to try to combine both geometries. So if you're looking on one point on the ground, basically you have to you have to find the same area from both geometries, and you can try to decompose. You can try to separate the movement in. Uh, different directions. So again, this is a fjord system here, the same site as a minute ago with these two landslides. And what we can do by providing these two, by, by using both geometries, it that actually we can move towards providing two dimensional information about a landslide, for example, and thereby we could better characterize the kinematics of what is going on. So some examples, uh, again, some landslides in Norway. Uh, this is an orthophoto. You could see it's qu quite clear that there's a big area here that is slowly moving towards the fjord. Uh, if we look at this ascending geometry, so you have the line of sight vector, which is shown up here. We could see that all of this is, is quite red and quite nicely uh, delineated. There is more deformation in the top, in the upper part of the landslide than in the lower part. If we look at the other geometry, this descending data, we do not really see uh, any movement. Uh, but when we try to combine both of these, we could actually uh, separate the movement into a vertical component which is shown here. So now we can see that there is, this is, this is the, the vertical displacement of this landslide. 
and we could separate into a horizontal component in the east-west direction. So, so what you can see for this particular landslide is that there's a quite significant horizontal component in this east-west uh, direction. We could also even decompose this into uh, a combined displacement, which uses both directions. So this is the, the, the magnitude of the displacement vector. But what is maybe most interesting for these, uh, for the geologists who are working with landslides and, and risk assessment is to look at what we call the dip angle. So what is the displacement direction of each pixel? Uh, so, so what we can see is that the highest velocities are found in the upper part, but the dip angle is varying along the slope. Uh, so it's relatively steep in the upper part, and then it becomes more and more horizontal and even upwards towards the toe of this landslide. And what we can do then is to take a profile through the landslide, and you can make a cross section like this. And now this is a lot of information uh, that could tell you, that could be used to explain the processes uh, going on. So based on this, you could have good indications whether this is a large complex rotational landslide with a very deep sliding plane, or whether it's, it's just movement of the, of the top um, material. So, so this is really a useful way of, of working with this data. So we are actually moving from the single observations in the two different line of sight directions. And now we are making a higher order product that, that could make the interpretation uh, a lot easier. So if we come back to this example, uh, again, with these two landslides on each side of the fjord, uh, you see here that they are uh, sensitive. Um, the two uh, observations are sensitive to different uh, directions. Uh, we could decompose this again into the vertical and horizontal component. And what you can see here is that this landslide here on this eastern side is having a much more horizontal uh, displacement component than this landslide on the other side. Uh, we could also look at the total length of the vector, so, and this dip angle, like I told you. So the dip angle tells you how steep is the direction of movement. And basically for both of these, you see that this, the, it's much steeper in the upper part and then it gradually decreases uh, towards the toe of the landslide. And again, if we take these um, uh, profiles, you could, you, could, you, could, you could start to interpret what kind of movement and, and what, is, uh, what is going on on this landslide. So I think I will stop there for this first part of the lecture. Um, are there any immediate questions? Well, I think there are questions on the chat box. Can you see them? No, I cannot see them directly. Uh, okay, so I can read for you. Uh, let's... Okay, then the first question was by looking at the fringes, how do we identify if the area is subsist? subsided or elevated. So it, it actually means that how to read the fringes. Yeah, that, that is a, that's a good question. Uh, well, the INSAR is, is always a, a relative technique. So you have to, so all the deformation <coughs> when you're looking at these interferograms, when you're looking at these raw fringe patterns, uh, all the displacement is relative to one stable area. Uh, so basically you have to know in the processing how you are defining this color, this color pattern, how it, how it goes. 
so usually we don't work uh, with these raw interferograms. Usually we make kind of higher order products where you look at velocity, where we convert this phase change into velocity, which is a lot easier to interpret. I actually see the questions here now. Okay. Uh, so the next question over snow surfaces. Uh, no, uh, inside doesn't really work over snow uh, because the snow could be wet. There you will have a loss of, a total loss of signal. But even if the snow is dry, you could have uh, water um, content in the snow, which is very hard to separate from, from any uh, ground motion. So we try to, to avoid uh, snow surfaces. And the next question, using INSAR, can we measure displacement due to glacial isostasy? Um, absolutely. Of course, that is one of the most um, tricky and hard signals to estimate because it's so small. So because it is glacial uh, rebound, you typically have a a very small signal on the order of a few millimeters over very wide spatial scales. Uh, so absolutely it is possible, but you need a long time series. And I think the Sentinel time series is still not quite long enough in order to do that. But people have used INSAR to look at more local, um, uh, uh, local uh, ground deformation or not deformation, gr ground heave due to the melting of glaciers. That has already been, uh, been demonstrated. Uh, how do we interpret the fringes that will be seen on glaciers? Um, well, if you have fringes on glaciers, you have coherence. And if you have a signal on the glaciers, usually that is re directly relevant to the flow of movement of the glacier. I think it is really, you cannot really compare that to the glacial isostatic rebound. And uh, if you want to look at the rebound in Svalbard, that is going to be really, really difficult because you have a very small signal and then you have a lot of other uh, ground motion which is hiding that signal. We will go more through that in the next lecture. Uh, can INSTAR satellites face straight down to overcome the shadow effect. Um, no, they cannot work straight down. Uh, I think the steepest they can look uh, is about uh, 20 degrees. Uh, okay, good, thank you. Well, welcome back again. I hope you had some relaxed time to prepare for this second talk. Uh, we are now focusing on uh, INSAR for periglacial areas. So a lot of examples from Svalbard and uh, many of these, um, not quite all of them, but most of them are from uh, uh, a colleague of mine, uh, Lena Ruyer, who's a PhD student at Norse and uh, UNIS and uh, working with uh, uh, INSAR in Svalbard areas. So uh, what we see here is uh, uh, an area in Svalbard, uh, Advent Fjorden, and uh, you can clearly see that uh, there is a lot of uh, different colors, uh, meaning that there is a lot of uh, ground motion going on in the valley, in the hillsides, and uh, uh, in general, uh, almost everywhere. Uh, basically, <clears throat> what we observe in the Arctic regions is uh, the, the, the processes that we see in this cartoon. Uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, subsidence and, uh, and heaving of the terrain due to, due to freezing and thawing. So this is uh, an effect that we see a lot, for example, in the valley, uh, in the flat, uh, flatter part of the valley, you have a lot of freezing and thawing. Uh, due to the water content of the uh, active layer, uh, it will uh, compact uh, in summer when the ice melts and uh, it will heave in winter when the water turns into ice. 
Uh, you could have this effect also on some of the mountain plateaus. Uh, you could have uh, some toppling. Uh, it's very steep terrain, many places. Uh, you could have a lot of this, this effect. You could have many rock glaciers. This is one uh, quite common per glacial landform in Svalbard. And these usually tend to have a, a downslope uh, direction, movement direction. So they are creeping downslope with uh, rates of a few centimeters to maybe a few decimeters uh, per year, dependent on, on their state of development. You could have a, what we call solid fluxion, which is uh, another word for soil creep. So this is very abundant uh, everywhere in Svalbard. If you go and you see these, uh, these poles, and if you see that they are starting to tilt, that is usually due to the soil that is creeping. So the solid fluxion processes, which you see uh, a lot in the area around uh, Longyearbyen. Uh, you could have a uh, rock slide, rock fall processes where you have a larger piece of rock which is uh, moving. And this cartoon also shows the different geometries that we talked about in the last hour. So we have this descending geometry and we have the ascending geometry and they are sensitive to different uh, movement directions. Uh, so what we what can we use instar for? Well, we can we could try to tell to say something more about the freezing and thawing processes that goes on, and try to to relate all the variability that we observe in the instar to different kind of environmental variables uh, in in the Arctic. Uh, so. The idea is to try to say something about the processes and the factors that are controlling them. Uh, because in INSAR, what we are measuring is mainly the, the uh, effects. So we are measuring the, the, what you see on the right hand side here. We are measuring the vertical heave and subsidence. And we are measuring the dome slope, uh, slope displacement uh, of, uh, of, of slopes. So this is what we are documenting, documenting with the INSAR methods. But uh, these effects are, of course, due to some processes going on. So it's the freezing and thawing process of the active layer and, and different layers. You have the creep of, of permafrost in slopes. And then to the left, you have different factors that are controlling again, these processes. So it could be changes uh, in the climate, uh, uh, both uh, long-term, short-term, and local microclimate, topography, hydrology is very important. Uh, of course, vegetation plays a role, different kind of material on the ground. So all of this uh, is, is tied together and, and we are trying to work on, on explaining um, these uh, factors and processes and try to explain them better. Uh, there has been a lot of, uh, or quite a lot of, of research on using INSAR in these environments. Um, here are some of the references. I'm sure you will get a copy of this pre presentation. Uh, there is another uh, set of references uh, towards the end. Uh, but basically you could divide them into two groups. Um, who are focusing on different uh, processes. You have the mountain permafrost, which is more looking at slope processes, kinematics, making inventories of uh, unstable or moving rock glaciers, for example. Um, and then you have the other thematic team, which is more looking at the, the, the frost heave and thaw subsidence this annual signal that you can clearly observe in, in the lowlands and the, in the high, high altitude plateaus. Um, and as you can see, there has been a number of, of, of articles, journal papers that have been uh, looking at this, uh, this um, over the last uh, uh, ten, 10 years or so. Uh, so we will 
we have had different projects in Svalbard. We have, uh, for obvious reasons, focused around uh, Adventalen, uh, close to Longyearbyen. Uh, so this image shows some of the data sets that we have been been looking at. Uh, it's from different sensors. We are, of course, using Sentinel-1 data a lot, which is what we saw in the previous presentation many examples from. But we also have been acquiring uh, some high resolution commercial uh, satellite SAR data from a German satellite called Terrasal X or TSX in these uh, uh, slides. And uh, they typically have a, a coverage of about uh, 30 by 50 kilometers. So this gray area here is, is an area which we have different geometries um, from different, uh, different sensors. And we have focused on, on that. So I will take you through uh, a number of uh, examples now. Uh, we will compare the results from th the different sensors. So the different sensors are different in, uh, in a couple of aspects. They are using a different uh, frequency. So Terrasar X is X-band, which is shorter wavelength. So it's three centimeters. And Sentinel-1 is five centimeters. And the revisit time is also different. So Terrasar X has a repeat cycle of 11 days, and Sentinel-1 has six days in Svalbard. Uh, the, uh, the spatial resolution is very different. The commercial satellite sensor has a resolution of down to a few meters. Uh, while Sentinel-1 has a, a resolution of 5 times 20 meters, so it, it's, it's quite different. Um, we will show you some examples uh, of using uh, multi-geometry. So what I mean by that is that we are combining both ascending and descending observations and trying to make these higher order products to look at uh, east, west and vertical displacement. So, and that again, you can relate to different uh, geomorphologic uh, uh, landforms and, and processes. Uh, and uh, we will also look at uh, some time series. So displacement time series and try to relate that to, to the temperature that you, for example, can observe in a, in a borehole. So all in all, we're trying to, to, to have a better understanding of the, of the landscape dynamics uh, based on this uh, remote sensed uh, inside data. Um, this is work uh, that has now actually been published in the remote sensing of environment. So this data is, is already available uh, there or the results are, are available. So focusing on the Sentinel-1 and Terrace x uh, comparison, uh, this is basically the main uh, result. We have used um, a so-called stacking method. So we are using a lot of satellite SAR observations and we are basically taking the average of many such um, uh, combinations. We are only looking at the data from the summer. Uh, so from June until September. So it's a relatively short uh, period of time. Uh, so in the upper part, in the upper figure, we see the high resolution data from Terrasar X. Uh, we have a lot of data. We, we started this time series in 2009 and we are still acquiring data. So this is an average of over the whole time period. So over eight years in this example, while the Sentinel-1 data in the lower part is covering a shorter period. It's only two years. So you cannot directly compare uh, the time period that they are uh, covering. Uh, the line of sight direction is very similar. So they are 
looking at almost the same uh, incidence angle, 37.9, 37.3. So it's, it's very comparable. Uh, but basically what we can see here is that both uh, these results look very similar. Um, they are showing subsidence in red in more or less the same areas. Um, and it's, it's, it's quite comparable at this level of, of zoom. Uh, however, what we can see is that the Sentinel-1 data has slightly better coverage. So for example, in this red area in the lower part, we can see that we have a better coverage. We have uh, points uh, where there are no points in the Terrasarax data. And that could be to, due to um, the changes in the ground reflectivity. So it could be due to the uh, soil moisture on the ground. So that C band, the longer wavelength is, is, is slightly better, but also having a shorter revisit time improves. So it, it helps to preserve what we call the coherence. So the signal quality in interferometry. Uh, we, all of these observations are relevant uh, to a reference point, which is the same for both data sets or for all data sets that we will show. It is on the airport in Longyearbyen, you can see the star. And we will also focus on these three areas because area one, two, three, because they are illustrating different kinds of processes that goes on uh, on the ground. So we will now zoom in and, and look at some of the differences uh, between the two sensors. And this is quite an interesting comparison because the Terrasar X data is very expensive commercial data that you have to pay for, while the Sentinel-1 data is free and open access. So it, it's an interest, very interesting comparison to see whether you need the high resolution data or you can live with the open access uh, Sentinel-1 data. So if we zoom in to the different areas in the upper part, uh, there is an active rock glacier and some colluvium material along this uh, quite steep slope here. And this is the Terrasar X data that you see here. Uh, of course, you can see that the spatial resolution is a lot better. You can here you can really see the, the pixels, so to say, while this gives more information about the individual um, uh, uh, smaller landforms. So of course you could use the high resolution data to better discriminate between the processes uh, on, on an individual landform. Uh, and to the right is, is a very simplified geomorphological map that shows uh, these, these processes or the mapping of, this, of these landforms. Uh, the other example is a, is a glacier in Ugledal. It's a debris covered glacier. And the reason why it is blue in this geometry is because it's moving to, towards the radar. So again, this little arrow here is showing the line of sight. And it is obvious that the glacier is flowing down slope towards the west, meaning that it's coming towards the radar. And with the color scale that we have uh, chosen to use, it is blue. And again, it's the same thing, uh, Terrasarax and Sentinel-1 more or less uh, show the same uh, landforms. Again, of course, Terrasarax ha has higher resolution. Uh, the lower example is, uh, is in the, the uh, alluvial, alluvial uh, part, showing alluvial material. Uh, in the valley of Adventalen, so it's it's not so much topography. There is some solid fluxion going on uh, in the hillsides on the north and south part and in Endalen. But the main part of the signal here we see in red is due to the thawing of the active layer. So it's the subsidence of the active layer as the uh, 
ice content in the active layer melts. So the, the terrain is then subsiding um, of several centimeters. So the scale here is plus minus five centimeter. So the whole terrain or is more or less uh, moving down, so subsiding with, with around five centimeters. So it's, it's, it's a quite significant um, change of the landscape that goes on in Svalbard uh, in the summer period. And again, in the, in the fall, uh, there is a, an uplift part. Um, so what we can do is we can use these two geometries and try to say something about this, uh, um, the, the, the two dimensional part and see what can we, what can, what more information can we get when we look, when you use both geometries. Um, so what we can do is that we are again combining the ascending and descending geometries in order to retrieve these two dimensional vectors. So normally we estimate the horizontal east-west component and the vertical component. Uh, because we don't have sensitivity to the north-south sl facing slopes, we usually mask them out for the interpretation. Uh, so to the right, you can see the vertical part in the upper uh, figure. So you can clearly see that there's a lot of vertical uh, subsidence going on in this uh, valley. Uh, if we look at the horizontal component east-west, we can see that it, it, it's slightly different than in the in the valley bottom. It's quite uh, stable. While in the east-west, uh, uh, in, in the valleys, you have uh, more displacement. And here is probably a, a rock uh, rock glacier here. Um, and in the lower part, you can see that we have the um, the uh, geomorphologic uh, uh, map of the area. Uh, so again, what we're using, we're using both geometries. We're using the different line of sight vectors from the ascending satellite. We're combining it with the descending, and we are estimating this vertical and horizontal uh, displacement uh, based on, on this data. And based on this geomorphological map, we, we did a, a statistical analysis where we selected uh, 3000 pixels per class and then compare that with the observations of the vertical and horizontal component. And, and this is a quite complex um, uh, slide. Uh, I, I won't go into, into much detail, but basically what it, what it shows is that the different landforms um, or, cl or, or classes here have different uh, uh, behavior dependent on the slope direction. So you could you could basically see that uh, they are different. Uh, so the two examples in the lower part here is for a rock glacier, and you can see that the rock glacier has has a combined vertical and horizontal displacement part. So it, it, all the 3000 points from the different rock glaciers, it's, it's spread out over this area. Uh, while the sediment part from the Julian is almost purely vertical. So it's, it's purely a, a subsidence uh, part. So, so you could look at the different units and you can try to use this data and this information in order to, to understand more about the, the distribution of the behavior for the different um, units. And uh, I suggest you, if you're really interested in this, you should look up this paper and, 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 and see what's, what's being discussed there. Uh, moving towards the, the last uh, example from this series is we have we have until now only looked at the average velocities. So based on the number of observations, we typically estimate the annual displacement trends. But the INSAR method also provides a time series of deformation. So we can see the evolution of the displacement. And of course, in, in permafrost and, and 
areas with, with freezing and thawing, you would expect to see a lot of different um, displacement, which cor directly cor correlates to the temperature variation. So whether the ground is frozen or not, and in which, which, um, which process it is going on in the ground. So what we can do and what we have done in this example is to try to separate the time series into one uh, part which only covers the thawing period and that we have defined the thawing period as from early June until 1st of October and then we have defined a freezing period which is after October and until December and if we if we separate these two periods and look at, at the deformation which is going on for example here in Adventalen we can clearly see this uh, thawing which is going on as the landscape as the ice in the active layer melts, the whole landscape thaws, and of course the more water there is in the active layer, the more ice and the more it will thaw. So it's also related to the hydrology of, of this area. But what was quite interesting to see is that we were also able to detect the corresponding uplift, the heave of the terrain as, as it freezes again. Uh, so I think this was one of the first examples that I've seen where you could actually use the ENSA data to look at how the landscape is, uh, is changing uh, throughout one, one season. Um, and here we used this um, time, uh, one of these time series methods uh, that I didn't go into any details about, but this is the SBAS time series method, which provides a, a time series. Uh, we will now show some, show you some. I will now show you some of these time series for some of these points that you see in these two uh, examples here. So the first example is number one, which is from a rock glacier in Longyearbyen, close to Huset in Longyearbyen. This is uh, Longyearbyen. And there's a rock glacier here and what we can see this is on along the y-axis is the displacement this is the line of sight displacement from one direction so we can see that this area had subsided or moved about eight centimeters in the period from june until december so we see that it has a fairly linear displacement trend all the time. It doesn't change much. Uh, the second example is point number two, which is this uh, debris covered glacier. And we see that this glacier is also moving relatively linear and it is moving towards the radar. That's why it's blue. So we see that it, it, is, it is coming towards the radar and it has moved almost 12, 13 centimeters um, over this time from June till December. But if you select some other points that are in the uh, uh, more flat part of this valley or along this valley side, the time series become much more interesting because they are much more non-linear uh, this is an, an alluvial uh, sediment area and what we can see there is that there's a clear exponential thawing or subsidence in the thawing period which ends roughly in end of September and then there is a, an uplift when the ground freezes again in early October. So we see that the, this these points, they subside about five, six centimeters. And then we see that during the few months until December, 
they are slowly uplifting again, but not quite because the, this, this uplift process probably goes on uh, much longer than we observed in this time series. So again, if we go in and look at insert data at the same location where we have some boreholes, where we have some in situ observations, we could uh, clearly see uh, the correlation. So the upper part shows the, uh, the temperature, the color is the temperature versus depth uh, along the y-axis and the x-axis shows the time. So the blue here is, uh, is, fro is frozen ground and this is the transition between the frozen ground and, and, uh, and the thawed when the thaw thawing starts. And the same, same thing happens towards the end of the, the summer season. And we see that the, different, the two different boreholes ha have, a, have a quite different uh, uh, temperature profile. Uh, so the lower part shows the INSA data. Basically, our INSA time series starts in June because there tends to be quite a lot of snow cover before that. And when you have snow melt, uh, usually we have a very low quality of the signal. So our observations usually start early June, mid June in Svalbard. So we only capture this, this thawing part. Uh, it's really hard to see this, uh, this part before. We see the thawing part. And what we observe is that there's a almost perfect correlation between the temperature. So when the temperature becomes cold, or frozen when the ground freezes, we see an immediate uplift of the ground. And this we can observe for, for both these boreholes. Uh, of course, one of them is, is, is more significant than, than the other one. Uh, but this, this, is a, this is a good example, I think, of, of trying to use the INSO data to understand more about the processes that goes on. And of course, there is a relation between, it's, it's a non-trivial non -trivial relation between the amount of subsidence and the depth of the active layer, for example. So there is people who are trying to model the depth of the active layer based on how much subsidence we observe using INSAR. Uh, we have done a small project where we used INSAR around Longyearbyen trying to uh, look at uh, slope stability uh, and see if to identify areas uh, that are clearly moving. We used different kinds of satellite sensors and we were ident trying to identify hotspots uh, around Longyearbyen, which we summarized in this report to uh, Svalbard Miljövän Fund. And I think uh, the report should be, should be open. It's, it's in Norwegian though. Uh, so we used INSA data from different data sets, uh, Terrasar X, Radioset 2, Sentinel-1, different time series and so on, different resolutions, different line of sight and all of this. But basically the idea in this project was to move away from the different line of sight to, to make some hotspot, to so try to identify some, some areas that really uh, showed significant movement in, in many of these observation geometries. Uh, so I, I I'll just show you some of these areas that we observed in this data set. Uh, this is a rock glacier in, uh, in Longyearbyen, close to Huset. It is actually one of the fastest moving areas in around Longyearbyen. Uh, we see a lot of movement in, in different uh, mining deposits. Uh, around Longyearbyen, we see movement close to the glaciers, we see movement uh, on the rock noses, and we also see some movement in the tundra areas in the, in the city center. So related to this active layer thawing. Um, so, so this is uh, what we observed here. Uh, again, some examples. Uh, 
what we see, it's, it's, it's a lot of, of man-made uh, mining deposits still moving and so on, but also some landforms, rock glaciers that, that are move, moving um, quite a lot. Uh, of course, these areas is interesting because it, it has an annual uh, signal as well. And as you, you are aware of, there has been quite a lot of avalanches in Longyear or around Svalbard lately. So it's, it's quite interesting to do this work and try to relate the, the, the ongoing processes with, with what we can observe with the satellite data. Uh, in, back to INSA Norway, uh, again, uh, there is currently no INSA Svalbard, but we'll see whether that will ha happen, hopefully. Uh, some time, uh, but there is still quite a lot of permafrost processes uh, going on in the mainland of Norway. Uh, I will show you one example here. Uh, this is we are here a little bit east of Tromsø at 69 degrees north, um, where there is a lot of permafrost uh, processes. There is discontinuous sporadic permafrost in this area, and uh, a lot of uh, annual freezing and thawing of the terrain, of course, since especially on, on the mountain tops. Uh, we would focus on, on this area where there's some active or some very active rock glaciers. Uh, this was uh, work done by a, another PhD student that we had uh, a, a couple of years ago, uh, looking at this landform, this Adyat rock glacier complex. It's actually not only one rock glacier, but there is currently two very active rock glaciers, but there is also a, uh, a number of, of old inactive rock glaciers in this area. So it's on a south facing uh, terrain altitude about uh, 800 to 1000 meter above sea level. Again, it's, it's a very active area. You can see a lot of rockfall uh, activity going on in front of the, of the slope. Uh, these are very active. It's about one kilometers, the, this, this biggest one. And if you look at it from the side, uh, you will see that it, it's, it's very active. And we also have uh, made a time lapse. Uh, I don't have it now, but this rock glacier is, is, is more or less acting like a conveyor band. So it's just moving all of this material downslope with several meters per year. So it, it's, it's a very active uh, area. Uh, we have used a number of remote sensing methods, not only satellite SAR, but we have also had uh, people in the field. We have some temperature loggers uh, and we have also used the ground-based radar system, which I will show you some examples because this uh, landform is actually moving too fast. So basically this is uh, satellite INSO data but we see that there is no information, there, there are no pixels. There's no, there's, we don't know what is happening here. But of course, when you are a little experienced in INSAR and you see this, you should be suspicious because this is actually, uh, because the deformation is, is too big. So what we did is we installed a ground-based system on, on the ground a couple of kilometers away from the site. And um, we did some campaign work uh, during a few weeks to look at uh, the displacement of these slopes. And we were clearly able to detect the displacement of this, of these uh, rock glaciers, but also some of the other ones, which are uh, also quite active. So this is the data we had. We had did the same experiment twice in two different years. So we can see it's slightly different, but overall this rock glacier moved about two meters in three weeks. So it's, it's a very active uh, rock glacier. Uh, if we look at the SAR data and on the SAR images, you can actually also see the the, uh, the displacement or the movement directly. So this is uh, the first image from 2009. This is the last image from 2016. And I will try to go a little bit back and forth, but you can, you can quite clearly see that 
oops, that the front of this rock glacier is uh, advancing by many, many meters during this, uh, this period. Uh, we can also make a time lapse video. Uh, I'll try to, to run it now. And this is over a seven year period. So you can see that this rock glacier is really flowing um, down slope uh, over this time of, of, of seven years. So it, it's a very active landform. And how can we how can we measure this using radar remote sensing? Well, we do have a number of techniques. INSAR doesn't really work because it's moving too fast. So we have no information here. With Terrasar X, we have no information with Sentinel-1. We can use terrestrial or ground-based radar observations. However, these are quite complex operations and quite expensive because you need to have one of these instruments. But you can also use a different method, which I won't go into much detail about, but it's called offset tracking. So basically you are using an image matching technique between different images and trying to see the displacement of these features that you can identify in both images. Uh, this is very uh, often used for glacier studies. There was a question asked about uh, glaciers and surging glaciers. Uh, then I would recommend to look into offset tracking from satellite SAR data because that's that method is really capable of, of detecting uh, a fast movement. And in this case, we use the high resolution TerraSelect data. So we have the very high resolution to start with. Uh, so we did this offset tracking using all the different pairs. And that was quite interesting because that provided us with annual velocities over these two landforms. So here we see the, the displacement vectors of this uh, these two rock glaciers. So this is the major one and there's a smaller one to the right. This was in 2009. And in 2016, we can see that the, the larger rock glacier clearly uh, has an acceleration phase. Um, so something is going on. Uh, we have many years of observation. So what we can do is to make one, one image, one of these per year. We can make a profile uh, through the rock glacier and we can look at the velocity. Um, so this is a profile starting from the top and going towards the bottom. And we can clearly see that the velocity is really increasing. Uh, so this was in 2009 in the lower part and we started in, we ended it this time say in 2014, 15, but uh, it was more than a double of the velocity during this, this period. And it was just increasing uh, all the time. Uh, so we can, we can look at these different uh, uh, ve velocity fields from the different years. We have also used uh, optical um, remote sensing data to look at uh, the front position. So we were actually able to, to, to acquire or get hold of some old uh, optical satellite data all the way back to 1954 and 77 and 2006, 2014. And we could clearly see how the front of this uh, uh, rock glacier has advanced uh, during this time. Uh, again, this is this is work published by uh, Ericsson. So you, you, sh you should look into it if you're interested. Um, so just a quick summary of what we have observed here. We have observed a long term increase in velocity at decade scale. So we are comparing the the old optical data identifying some markers and estimating the velocity during this early phase. And when we have the satellite observations, we clearly see that there is a quite dramatic increase in velocity and an acceleration uh, during the, late, the later years. Uh, when you look at this profile, through the rock glaciers, we can see that uh, the acceleration is mainly in the, in the lower part of the um, 
rock dishes, but the upper part is more variable. Um, when we are trying to explain why is this rock glacier uh, experiencing an acceleration, we can look at the mean, mean annual air temperature and the precipitation over the last uh, 50 years. And we can see there, there, that the temperature is rising and there's more precipitation. So this, this could be uh, some of the factors. Um, again, I just wanted to show you this example because using a ground-based radar is, is quite uh, important and it's, it's used a lot in the mainland of Norway because you could use the system for real-time or near real-time monitoring and early warning. And uh, this is uh, an example from one of the uh, major uh, rock slide or high-risk rock slide sites in Norway where they are using this uh, such a system to, to monitor. Uh, and they are actually using it on a day-to-day -day basis and they are making their decisions whether to evacuate based on their different uh, velocities they are observing using this system. So th this is a radar system that is permanently installed and it's, it's, it's producing data all the time. So, so they are using it in, in an in a operational matter. Um, so this, this, is, this is also quite nice and it, it's based on the same INSAR method where you have the instrument uh, on the ground. Um, the last example I will show is from Cap Linea, is your radio. radio. Uh, this is a, an optical image. Uh, there is uh, a lot of peroglacial landforms and features in this area. Uh, you have a, a fairly big solid production sheet all along this hillside. Uh, there's a, a number of rock glaciers here. And of course, you have a plateau with a lot of um, thawing processes going on. So if we look at the INSA data, it's, it's quite interesting to see. And uh, given all the, <laughs> the examples I have demonstrated already, you, you, you should be able to say so. And, and to try to kind of classify this image that you have a lot of thawing in this uh, area, the flatter part, and in the uh, hillside you have solid production and the uh, movement of the um, of the rock glaciers, uh, as long as uh, uh, along with other cre creeping processes. Um, so for this uh, afternoon's uh, exercise, uh, we could. We have made some data available over um, an area around Longyearbyen, Advent Island. Uh, you have to log in. Uh, I, will, I will make this uh, username password on the chat or, or someone can, could add it there. Uh, you have to log in. Uh, there's two different data sets there. Um, and uh, I think we, we, we will go more through that uh, later but uh, I'm just giving you the opportunity now to, to, to take notes if you want. Uh, so try to summarize uh, what we have gone through. Uh, it is very valuable to have multi-sensor, multi-geometry INSAR, uh, because there, is, there, there are li limitations to the method when you only have one geometry. So really you should use both ascending, descending, in, in, in order to, to try to classify the different um, uh, displacement going on. Uh, you can use INSAR to identify different patterns for different uh, features and landforms. Um, you can also do this uh, seasonal inversion. If you look at the time series, you could identify the thawing period from the fr freezing period and also try to relate this temperature to look at, 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 uh, at, in, at the correlations. Um, and of course, you could also use these terrestrial radars if you want to document really fast moving landforms and, and daily uh, or short term variations of, of the displacements. Um, so summary slide <laughs> number two, INSAR is of course very valuable uh, for ground deformation mapping. It's, it's, it's a rather unique method. Uh, you 
should get um, ground deformation measurements by having a GPS station, but you need quite a lot of these GPS stations in order to get the spatial sampling. So everyone realizes that that's really not an option. So INSAR is, is, is quite unique. And as I said, in Norway, it's, it's actually being routinely used for, for landslide mapping. But for Svalbard, it's, it's still quite unexplored, I would say. Uh, Sentinel-1 really was a game changer since you had data every six days all the time throughout the year. So there's a number of things you can do and you can exploit this data. So it's really a fantastic uh, data set and, and source of information. Uh, you can, of course, improve the understanding of well, landslides or rock glaciers or, or, or kinematics of, of the dif displacement patterns that, that uh, you are looking at. And the last point here is that in our, in our experience, you really need to have some good data exploration tools in order to, 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 for people to use this data. Because uh, like I told you that the whole of Norway is 6 billion points and there is no way you could treat or, or analyze that data on any desktop uh, computer. I think most uh, GIS software systems, they don't like uh, point data sets with, with more than 10,000 points or even then it's, it's slow. So, so you really need to, to, you should have a data, a tool to explore the data and, and then to export some data into, into whatever uh, analyze tool you want to use. Uh, so in the next um, uh, next part, uh, we will we will look at this INSA Norway service and uh, also uh, look at some of these de demo data sets that we have uh, made available for, for Svalbard. So that concludes my presentation.